Uh, we're in the book of Hebrews chapter 3 this morning, Hebrews chapter 3. So please turn to that if you can. And uh, let's, last uh, Lord's Day, Pastor Dan, Dan preached on the, the glories of God, the glories of God. This morning, I want to talk about the wrath of God. This is our title, the wrath of God. Let's begin by reading verse number 11, Hebrews 3.11. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Now God's speaking of the Old Testament Israelites, and he says he's a, he has some wrath, some anger for sin. A lot of the modernists and liberals and apostates say that God is only a God of love. Well, that's one of his attributes, yes, but also holiness and grace and omniscience and omnipresence and all these others. One of his attributes is wrath against sin. Very often preachers never preach on that, but the Word of God is clear. For instance, in the book of Numbers 22 and verse 10, the Lord's anger was kindled at the same time, and he swear, saying, God was angry with the Israelites for disobedience to his words. He's angry with anybody today who disobeys his words as well. Whether saved or whether lost, he has that anger. Then he says in verse 11, Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. Save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. And so the Lord's wrath was only in anger with only those that didn't follow him, those 40 years in the wilderness journey. And then uh, in John 3, 36, we know that one, let's say it together. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The wrath of God, those that do not believe the Lord Jesus Christ, it's very important to see that. Now, as many people don't believe these verses, don't believe God has any wrath, but it says very clearly, He wants every man, woman, and child to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If they do not, God's wrath is upon them. They'll land in the lake of fire in hell itself. And then in Romans 1 and verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. That word for hold is who keep down the truth, who not block the truth. And God's wrath is against that. Preachers today and ministers and apostate ministers and those unbelieving people in the pulpit and there's millions of them all over the world, they don't believe God has any wrath. They don't believe, it's, they believe in universalism. Everybody's going to heaven, wonderful, wonderful, false. It's very clear that uh, only those that believe in genuine faith in the Lord Jesus will be in heaven. The wrath of God, in verse 116 of Romans, revealed from heaven against the ungodliness of men. Any ungodliness, he's got wrath against them. Then in Romans 5 and verse 9, much more than now being justified by his blood, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ declares people righteous if they trust in him genuinely as their Savior. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. The only one in heaven and on earth that can save anybody from the wrath of God is the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Saved from wrath. So see, these apostate preachers don't believe there's any such thing as wrath or hell. The scriptures are very clear on that. Only through genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ can be saved. Then again in Romans 13 and verse 4, uh, this is talking about true rulers. Not these fake and phony rulers that praise the evil and put down the good. Those are phony ministers, phony rulers. But in Romans 13:4, he that is a good, faithful ruler, biblical ruler, he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. Our rulers today, if you do that which is evil, be afraid. No, be good, be all right, but do that which good, then you've got to be for the absolute opposite of Romans 13. And those that are one day going to herd everybody into the FEMA camps, the death camps, the prison camps, are going to these preachers are trained wrongly, going to knock on your door, 
You know, say, now I want you to come to the FEMA camp, there's food there for you, you're starving, and so on. And they take the idea that everything has got to be obedient. They use Romans 13, but they use it wrong. These are evil rulers. We don't obey them. They'll herd you into buses, herd children into buses, and it's coming. The FEMA camps have 34 of them already set up with the, the, the barbed wire not facing out, but, or facing in to keep you yeah, out, but facing in so they can't get out once you get in. So, very serious indeed. Minister thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid of the rulers. For he beareth not the sword in vain. He is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil, not him that doeth good. Biblical government is only that which does wrath on those that do evil, not that do good. Then in Ephesians 5 and verse 6, Paul says, From prison in Rome, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience, God's wrath and anger. Then in Colossians 3 and verse 6, he says, For which things the seek the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Again, those that are disobedient to the Lord, God's wrath will be poured upon them. And the uh, first Thessalonians 1 and verse 10, for the believers in Christ writing for the church, to the church of Thessalonica and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, bodily raised from the dead, even Jesus, which deliver us, those genuine Christians, from the wrath to come. Only through the Lord Jesus Christ can we be delivered from this terrible wrath. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 9. For God has not appointed us, that is, genuine Christians, to wrath, but to obtain salvation for our Lord Jesus Christ. And again in Revelation 6 and verse 16. They'll say to the mountains and rocks, these people under that tribulation period, fall on us, hide us, from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. When it came the first time, it came to seek him to save the lost. But when it goes back in the tribulation period, it's going to be the wrath of the Lamb against unrighteousness. And then verse 17, For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Then again in Revelation 19 and verse 15, And out of his mouth, that is the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ, goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth out the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That's one of the scriptural things, that God's righteousness is there, his, his love is there, his uh, standards are there, his omnipotence and omnipresence is there, but also his wrath is there against evil. Then he says, it says, they shall not enter into my rest, the rest of Scripture. They talked about the rest of Canaan. There's many rests. For instance, in Matthew 11, 28, we know that one. Let's say it together. The Lord Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Only in the Lord Jesus can we find true rest with God. In Hebrews 3 and verse 18, to whom he swore that they should not enter into his rest, but to those that believed not. But we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. That's why they were kept out of Canaan. Many thousands of Israelites were kept out and died in that wilderness, 40 years in the wilderness. There Revelation 14, verse 11. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest. These are people in hell in the lake of fire. No rest, day even nor night, worship the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Some of the falsely teach that those that receive the mark of the beast can somehow be saved. No, the scriptures are clear. Anybody that receives that mark, he's lost forever. Then Revelation 14, verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, from henceforth he saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. Perfect rest in the heavens above. Let's read together verse number 12 of this chapter. Take heed, brethren, 
lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now, taking heed. We've got to be heedful of God's words. And there's many scriptures on take heed in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 10. In other words, just don't be negligent to read God's words and then take heed to the words that you read. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 10, according to the grace of God given unto me, uh, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's speaking about the judgment seat of Christ here. Another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. If you're a genuine Christian, the Lord Jesus is your foundation. Take heed how you build on him. And then 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Every step we take is but one step from a fall. We can't be boastful and proud. We've got to take heed. And we don't just think we stand, but we've got to take heed lest we fall. Every step, as Dr. Lewis Bray Schaefer used to tell us at Dallas Theological Seminary for four years he taught us, man, each step is an incipient fall. An incipient fall, a beginning of a fall. If you don't put that other leg out together. And then in Jeremiah 7, verse 24, they hearken not, or inclined their ear, talking about the Israelites, but walked, walked in the counsels and the imagination of their evil heart, went backward and not forward. And then uh, also in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, we know that one, let's say it together. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to the ways and according to the fruit of his doing. So we've got to take heed to God's word. Then departure. These departed from the faith, departed from what the things of the Lord were, and people depart today. Daniel 9, verse 5. Be careful, we've been departing from the precepts and from thy judgments. Let's read verse number 13 together. But exhort one another while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened to the deceitfulness of sin. We've got to encourage and exhort one another. There are many scriptures on that. It's Acts 4.22, for example, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in their faith. That's what we've got to exhort people. Not some fake version of the Bible, but the faith, the doctrines of Scripture. In Romans 12, and verse 8, He that exhorteth an exhortation, and let these people have the gift of exhortation to use it to the glory of God. 1 Timothy 4, 13, Till I come, Pastor Timothy, there at the Church of Ephesus, give attendance to reading and to exhortation and to doctrine. And then in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, Paul says to Pastor Timothy, uh, preach the word. We say that every Sunday morning. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That's a wonderful verse. And Titus 1 and verse 9, Paul says to Pastor Titus, in the Isle of Crete, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught holding it fast, not departing from it, as many churches have done, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. Then again in Titus 2, and verse 15, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. In Hebrews 10, and verse 25, we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but exhorting one another. Then in Jude 1, and verse 3, I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Contend for the doctrines of the scriptures. That's what he's saying to do. We've got to do that. In our church we do that. Day by day, week by week. Contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Then our hearts should be hardened. Our hearts and our minds. In Exodus 8, verse 15, there was respite. He hardened his heart as Pharaoh and didn't hearken to the word of God. In 1 Samuel 6, and verse 6, again, 
Wherefore then do ye harden your hearts, as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts, when he had wrought wondrously among them, and did not let the people go? Then in Second Chronicles 26.13, talking about Zedekiah, he rebelled against the king Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear to God, but he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. None of us should harden our hearts when the scriptures say something. We should openly accept it and try the best we can to follow it. And then in Daniel 5, and verse 20, talking about Nebuchadnezzar, and his heart was lifted up, his mind hardened in pride. And he was persecuting the Israelites, and God had to take him out to the backside of the desert and straighten him out. Finally, he got the point. In Proverbs 26, and verse 24, He that hateth, dissembleth, or deceiveth with his lips, and layeth up deceit within him. Deceit is very bad. It's a, it's a very serious sin. When he speaketh fair, believe him not. There are seven abominations in his heart, whose hatred is covered by deceit. Sometimes hatred can be covered by deceit. Well, we don't want to go out and say, oh, I hate you, or I do this or that, but sometimes we deceive people by words of deceit. Then in Jeremiah 17, 9, we said it before, let's say it again. We, we don't. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, and who can know it? Well, the Lord says, I, the Lord, search the heart. And the Lord does search the heart. Then in Mark 7, verse 21, the Lord Jesus said to those who were around and listened to him, For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed many things, evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit from the heart. When we deceive people, it's a heart disease. These are 17 different sins, 17 that come from our hearts lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. The Lord Jesus said, all these evil things come from within and defile the man or the woman. In Colossians 2, and verse 18, he writes from prison to the church of Colossae, Beware, lest any man spoil you. We should not be spoiled for the things of the Lord. Many Christians get spoiled very seriously. Spoil you how? through philosophy, that is the love of wisdom. Many young people are spoiled in their, their grammar schools, their early age, their high schools, their colleges. Many men are spoiled in colleges and seminaries, spoiled through philosophy, not the Bible, the Word of God, and vain deceit. So not the way people are spoiled. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Let's read verse number 14 together. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Those who are genuine Christians, yes, they're saved, they're, they're believers, but partakers of the Lord Jesus, if we hold fast, if they hold fast, two things, confidence and steadfastness. Steadfast is, is firmness, firmness in the faith, firmness in the doctrines, firmness in our Savior. There are various verses on partakers. For instance, Second Corinthians 1 and verse 6, Whether it be afflicted, it's for your consolation, Paul writes, and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And then he says, In our hope that you be steadfast, knowing that ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye also be paid partakers of the consolation. Many new Christians and Christians of that day suffer greatly. People today, many Christians all over the world are suffering. We haven't yet begun to suffer in this nation yet as Christians, but we're going to begin that with the rulers once to take us to these FEMA camps. And other things. Many Christians are suffering, suffering from disease, suffering from serious situations of health, partakers of the suffering. Then Colossians 1 and verse 12, Paul says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us 
meat or fitting, or to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. One day, genuine Christians or genuine born-again believers will be partakers of the saints in light and the glories of heaven. And then in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Many Christians are ashamed of his testimony, sad but true. Nor of me, his prisoner. Don't be ashamed of Paul or any prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Many people do have afflictions by preaching the gospel of Christ. I remember as a chaplain, Navy chaplain on active duty for five years, my senior chaplain hated one of the sermons I preached right from scripture, Taming the Untamed. Here's a man that was just a, just a complete crazy man. The Lord tamed him. Afterwards, the senior chaplain said to me, Chapter 8, that was morally foolish and spiritually something sterile, else. Sterile. What was it? He said sterile. Sterile. He said, after this, you're no longer going to preach in the morning services because you preached that horrible story. I just preached the scripture. So he put me off and then let me, he said, they're going to call you to Washington. Well, they called him to Washington. And they told him, Put Chaplain Wade back in the morning service. I had already made an evening service. Had more people in the evening service than the morning service. Preach the word. So I put back in the service in the morning. One difference I made. I brought my tape recorder, recorded every sermon from then on. Then let that chaplain squawk and say, this is foolish, this is foolish. It's from the scriptures of the Bible. Anyway, partakers of this word. We should have confidence. And uh, then in 1 Peter 5, in verse 1, The elders which are among you I exhort, who are also an elder, witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Pastor Dan preached last Sunday on God's glory. Then confidence. We should have confidence. Psalm 118, verse 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. So many do put confidence in men. Trust and have confidence in in the Lord. Then Proverbs 25 and verse 19, I love that verse. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble. We don't have any confidence in unfaithful, but especially in time of trouble, unfaithful man is like a broken tooth. We try to eat with it, it doesn't work. And a foot out of joint, you can't walk. We've got to put confidence in the Lord, not an unfaithful people, whether they're pastors or preachers or missionaries or whoever it might be. Ephesians 3 and verse 11. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have access, genuine Christians, and boldness and access with confidence unto the faith in him. We can have confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ and firmness. Then he wants us to be steadfast and firm. For instance, in Daniel 6 and verse 26. I make a decree that Daniel was a man of prayer, but these who hated him, these three rulers that hated him, knew that Daniel was a man of prayer. Every morning of the evening, he threw open his window, looked to the east where Jerusalem was, they knew where he looked. He prayed to the Lord. One of these three men said, Now, King, you have to make an ordinance that nobody can ask anything except of thee. Just you. They know he had asked, and then they turned on death. They heard him praying, and they turned him over to the king and threw him into the fiery furnace. Fiery furnace. No, he was through the den of lions. It was three men, the other words. In the den of lions, the king was upset. He could hardly sleep that night. He finally went to that den. He said, Oh, Daniel, is thy God delivered thee? And Daniel said, Yes. And so he came out. He was very glad. But uh, Daniel was steadfast, very strongly. In his steadfast forever. Then in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, we may know this, so let's say it. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That was my father-in-law's favorite verse, Dad Sanborn, 1558 of 1 Corinthians. Steadfast, firm, firm, not not 
uh, stubborn but firm in the things of the Lord, unbend, unbending in the truth. Hebrews 6 is verse 18. By two immutable things, changeless things, in which it was impossible for God to lie. God is not a liar like people are. That we might have strong consolation, we have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have is an anchor of the soul, hope in salvation, hope in eternal life, hope in heaven, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into his, that within the veil, whether the forerunners for us entered even Jesus, made a high priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord Jesus is there, and he will take the genuine Christians to heaven as well. Then in 1 Peter 5, and verse 8, uh, Peter says, the apostle says, Be sober, be vigilant, always looking around. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, the devil is still the adversary of every genuine and true Christian. When we were first born, we were, in his, we were his children. Everyone who was born is a child of Satan. And the only way to get us out of that family is by trusting faithfully and genuinely the Lord Jesus Christ. And then as soon as we trust him, we become into God's family, the family of God. And uh, we've got to be very great and very strong. We're set for sober because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, that's his true colors. But sometimes he comes as an angel of light. When it comes as an angel of light, that's more deceptive than roaring like Here's roar. We, we turn from that. But when that old devil comes in his sweetness and angelic light, it's not light. He parades his light. It's a folk and fake and phony light. Be careful. As the answer, though, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom may devour, whom resist, steadfast in the faith. One of our friends in a different state has had problems in his mind for many times. He's gone to psychologists and different things. They've given him pills in times past. He's had that for scores of years. And he listens to us. He asks me to pray for him. I always do. And one of the things I say is follow the scripture. Resist the old devil. Steadfast in the faith. Just get away. It's a sad thing. I'm not a, a these people at psychiatrists say, all I know is the Bible. Try to give that man verses from the scriptures that will be quieted so he can sleep, and so it's a terrible thing. He said, I've trusted the Lord Jesus as my Savior. I don't know whether I've lost. I said, you can't be lost. But he just got to have the confidence of things of the Lord. I don't know once you get your mind so twisted, maybe you can never have that. But he thinks, well, has he, has he sinned too much? Is he lost? No, you can't be lost once you're genuinely saved. So we've got to pray for these gentlemen. But we've got to resist him steadfast in the faith. Let's read verse number 15 together. While it is said, Today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in a provocation. Now this is from the Old Testament that God told his people Israel. If ye hear his voice, today, every day, we've got to hear his voice. And the voice today is in his Bible, in the Word of God, the Scriptures. Every, when I was just a new Christian, I was only 16 years of age when the Lord saved me. And on the New Year's Eve, our pastor, Pastor Willis, said, Now I'd like every one of you in our church to read the Bible this year from Genesis to Revelation. I didn't know how to do that. I asked my future father, How do you do it? Uh, I don't know. But the, as I've said this many times before, the Bible that the janitor gave me when he led me to the Lord, just a janitor through the fifth grade, and I was a senior in high school, led me to the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave me a Bible, a wonderful Bible. In that Bible, in the beginning, it has every word that counts the number of words, kind of numbers of chapters, and number of verses. Of over 31,000 verses, words rather, in the it's got 131,000. So I divided that by 365, I got to 85, and that's why I came up with 85 verses per day to get you through the Bible in one year. I've tried to follow that ever since I've been saved. You say, why do you worry about following if you read the Bible once? Isn't that enough? No. Every day I am, and you are too, a different person, different needs. Sometimes you don't understand some of these verses. After so many years, 
you got to sense a few more things. You're still going to sense them, but keep on going. From the book of Daniel today and all these other things. So today, if you'll hear his voice from his words, harden not your hearts. That's a present tense in the Greek tense. It's a negative. That means a prohibition. It means something. Stop hardening your heart. For heirs to say, don't even begin to harden your heart. This is in the this is present negative. Stop hardening your heart. Keep that heart flexible for the Lord and for his word. Harden not your heart, as in the day of provocation. For instance, in Exodus 8, verse 15, Pharaoh saw that he hardened his heart. Pharaoh saw there was rest, but in rest, with all these plagues, he hardened his heart and didn't hearken to the Lord. 1 Samuel 6, and verse 6, Wherefore then do ye harden your hearts? as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts. In other words, the Israelites of old had hardened hearts. What is a hardened heart? It's a heart that doesn't be receptive to God's word, receptive to God's will. Very important. Their heart not be hardened. And then Second Chronicles 26, verse 13. Zedekiah rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. He hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. We should never harden our hearts from turning to the Lord. We should turn and follow his word. In Daniel 5 and verse 20, when Nebuchadnezzar's heart was lifted up and his mind was hardened in pride. That word for hardened is skeruno, skeruno. It means to be stubborn. One of the meanings of that is stubbornness. We say, I won't move. I've said many times there's only two things that people can do when confronted with truth. Confronting their error with truth. Number one, keep your evil and your falseness. Or number two, accept the truth and turn for your evil ways. That's what all of us should do. None of us is perfect. We must, if we're in the ways of falseness, we believe certain false things. When truth comes, accept it. Don't stay in our falseness and our evil. But that's clear on Don't be stubborn when the things of the Lord are there. Then that word provoke, uh, don't, in the provocation, when the Israelites provoked the Lord in the wilderness 40 years. In 1 Kings 15, verse 30, uh, because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he sinned, which he made Israel to sin, by his provocation, his provoking of the Lord, wherein he provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger. And that's the sad thing when we provoke our Lord. In 2 Kings 22 and verse 17, because they have forsaken me, Israelites have sick, forsaken me, have burnt incense unto other gods. Well, we may not burn incense to false gods, but many people will bow down to idols. The Roman Catholic Church has many, many idols, and the churches and all around, we don't have to bow down to other gods. That they might provoke me to anger, the wrath of God, with all the works of their hands. Wherefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. God is God of wrath. He's also God of love. And he's God of, if we trust the Lord Jesus as our Savior, he's a God of eternal life. In Psalm 95 and verse 8, David said, Harden not your heart as in the day of provocation. He's talking back to that 40 years in the wilderness when the Israelites refused to obey the Lord. If they refused to obey his word, they hardened their hearts in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers, those early Israelites, these early Jews, tempted me, tested me, proved me, and saw my work. What a miracle. God fed them for 40 years from manna from on high. Millions of them, probably 6 million if you include all the children, the women, and the men. God fed them 40 years. Can you imagine that with a drugstore, not a a food store, none of the stores, nothing to eat. God fed them. He, they, but for 40 years, my people did err in their heart and the temptation. Your fathers proved me, saw my work. 40 years was I grieved with this generation. He was grieved and saddened and said, It is the people that do err in their heart. Erring and sin begins in our heart, not in our head, but in our heart, the right inner core of our being. And they have not known my ways, and with whom I swear in my wrath, here God's wrath again, I swear in my wrath, they should not enter 
into my rest. And they didn't enter into his rest. So as I say, six million came out. Very few of those men came in to enter the rest of God's Canaan land. In Psalm 78 and verse 40, How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness, these Jews, and grieve him in the desert. They turned their back and tempted and tested and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. They had all sorts of enemies in Egypt, and God delivered them from those enemies. In that wilderness, they forgot all about what the Lord did for them. We should never forget what the Lord has done for us if we trust Him as our Savior, delivering us from sin, dying for us, delivering us and forgiving our sins, giving us a new life in Christ. We should never forget that at all. Let's read together verse number 16. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. We're glad that all of them did provoke the Lord, but I'm glad that all of them, but some did. For instance, in Numbers 26, verse 63, these are they that were numbered by Moses, and Eliezer the priest, who numbered the children of Israel in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho. But among these, there was not a man of them whom Moses and Aaron, the priests, numbered when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. Once you remember, as soon as they came out of Egypt, God counted them up. Every one of the twelve tribes counted every one of them, numbered them. But when they were about to enter into Canaan, they numbered them again. And there was not a single person living at that time that they had numbered forty years before. They had all sinned, they had grieved the Lord, and God saw that they were they died in that wilderness. Not a single, these were new people. Not one that numbered it was in the wilderness of Sinai. Then in verse 17, but Moses and Aaron were the only two. Moses and, was it Moses and Aaron? Joshua. Joshua, Joshua and Caleb were the only two that came out because they were faithful to the Lord. Let's read verse, read number, verse number 17 together. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? The sinners, the ones that were sinned, the Lord was grieved with and were upset about. Uh, now why was God grieved? In Numbers 14, verse 26, the Lord spake unto Moses and said, and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with the evil, this evil congregation? How long am I going to put up with them? Who murmur against me. They've just tried against Moses too. I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. These Jews that murmur against me. Say unto them, Say unto them, Moses, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as he has spoken in mine ears, so will I do it to you. Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. God forewarned them. Because of their sin, they would die. And all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, now the children were involved in that, those, they went into the wilderness, but the ones that were numbered, the older people, everyone that, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Chippewa and Joshua the son, I finally got to the two names that men came in, but all the rest of them. Except the children. I mean, these are older people that were numbered. Now, when he numbered the 40 years ago, those children were born. But the ones that were older, 40 years ago, every one. But then the children went in, and two others, Caleb and Joshua, the son of God. But your little ones, is very clear, which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in. They shall know the land which ye have despised. You older people, you despise the land, you despise me. I put up with you for 40 years. That's enough, he said. They can't go into Canaan. They can't go into that place. But as for you, your carcasses, your bodies, they shall fall in this wilderness. Your children shall wander the wilderness 40 years and bear your hoardings until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. Little children 
when your dad and mom die because you sinned against me? The children will wonder. They don't know who, what to go, where, how to handle themselves. After the number of the days in which he searched the land. Now these searches were 40 days searching the land of Canaan to see should they go in, should they not. And only two of them gave a good report. Uh, all the rest of them I said, no, we can't go in this giant sense so on. As the number of days, 40 days, searching out the land of Canaan, uh, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years, ye shall know my breach of promise. They were in the land, in the desert, for 40 years, and God is not going to, their carcasses will fall, those that sin. The little children will go in, but not these people that sin against me, except Caleb and Joshua. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed, and there shall they die. God keeps his promises, the good ones and the bad ones. This was a bad one, hard to take, but he keeps it as well. Let's read verse number 18 together. And to whom swear he unto that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. The ones that believe not the Lord, in Psalm 78 and verse 8, 19, for example, yea, they spake against God, they said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock, and water gushed out. The streams overflowed. And can he provide flesh for the people? And therefore the Lord heard this, and was wroth. He was angry, and they wanted flesh, manna, or bread from heaven wasn't sufficient. They were flesh. And because they believed not God and trusted not in his salvation. In Psalm 106, verse 24, Yea, they despised in the pleasant land of Canaan. They believed not his word. We've got to believe God's word and know it and trust it and read it and know it. Follow it. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10. With all deceivableness, and unrighteousness and then the pairs, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That all might be damned who believe not the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ, and had pleasure in unrighteousness. Then finally, Jude 1 and verse 6 in this text. And the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. We've got to have genuine faith in the Lord, Old Testament faith, New Testament faith in our Savior. Let's read verse number 19 together. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Believing, not unbelief. In Mark 16, 11, the Lord Jesus said, And they, when they had heard that, that he was alive, had been seen of, of her, that is Mary Magdalene. Believe not, they didn't believe he was risen again bodily. After they appeared under another in the form of the two of them, as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they then. The different people testified, he's risen, bodily raised with dead, after being crucified for the sins of the world. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven. These eleven disciples and apostles that were still left, as they sat at meat, and abraded them, scolded them, for their unbelief and heart, hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Some 501 times saw him after his bodily resurrection. And many believe, no blood believe today, oh, they don't preach it in their church. They say, oh, he's raised again, but they don't mean, they don't say, I don't believe in his bodily resurrection, just mean spirit. But they did not believe. In John 3, 18, we know that, we'll say that one together. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is a way that we must do to have eternal life. And again, John 3.36, we know that one, let's say it together. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. This is serious. We've talked about this Hebrews 3.11, many, many good verses. But our title on the wrath of God. God does have love. He does have righteousness. God has holiness. But he also has wrath 
and those that just don't want to trust His Son, Lord Jesus Christ, for their salvation. They say, oh, I don't believe that. That's nonsense. Well, God says, all right, do you think it's nonsense to, not to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for your sins, not to trust Him? I'm sorry, but you must experience my wrath for all eternity to come in the lake of fire. And God's wrath is true. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't come to earth the first time in wrath. He came in love. He came for salvation. He came for those that trust Him as their Savior. He died for the sins of the world. But when He goes back the second time, second time, setting up at the day of the great tribulation, He'll be wrathful and He's a God of love as well as God of wrath. Got to be which side of the fence are we on? The reception of his love and holiness and grace, or reception of his wrath, because we've denied the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and just turned up our nose at him for eternal life. Let's close with a word of prayer. We thank thee, Lord, for thy word. Thank thee for the Savior, the Lord Jesus, who came into this wicked world. Men despised him, crucified the Lord of glory. We thank you that we can trust him genuinely in faith as our Savior and Redeemer, that he promised us eternal life. The second we trust him in our hearts in genuineness. We pray for any in our audience this morning, those here, those in the internet land, that ever trusted in him as our Savior may do it right now. And eternal life is theirs. We thank you for the great promise. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Let's take your hymnals again.